Today, um, I never know conceptually how sermon series are going to turn out. To, you know, there's no way to know whether they're going to be good or bad or you pray about it. You hopefully hear from God and create a sermon series. And, and so this one, uh, this one kind of um, has been a little bit shocking to hear feedback and people driving by and seeing things on the side. And, and so it's been neat. And, and we're going to continue in this supremacy clause um, sermon series today and, and next month or next week. And then we'll roll into our Easter series. But Paul is very good at doing this. He's very good at taking the doctrine or the philosophy or the theory and then making it uh, practical in our lives. And, and so he's good at saying, this is, this is how we should think about it, but then not just how you should think about it, this is what we should do about it. And I love that about his letters. He's not just writing about philosophy or some theory out there. He's saying, this is the way we have to think. And so in, if we think that way, then this is what we should be doing. And the gospel doesn't become extremely useful to us until we can wake up on a Monday morning. Everybody knows you're good Sunday afternoon. You just get out of church. But when you wake up Monday morning and the test comes and you have to flesh out what you said you believed on Sunday, on Monday morning, when you're not surrounded by a bunch of people going, amen. And Paul's very good at making that practical. And he does that in the third chapter of Colossians. So remember, we're dealing with a young church uh, that, this, that this belief in Christ is pretty new and fresh. And Paul's writing them a letter while he's in house arrest in Rome, he's writing them a letter, encouraging them because there were these philosophies coming into the church that were in danger of changing the, what they believed and how they acted. And so this, this thing called Gnosticism, which some of you know about, it was extremely popular in the second century, but it was just taking hold in the first century. This idea that Jesus wasn't God, um, this mixture of some Judaism, some Christianity, some pagan stuff, and then, and then they believed that all physical things were evil and only spiritual things were good. So Paul's combating this in his letter and, and we're walking down through this and in the first chapter he talks about Christ being God and supreme over everything. He's a ruler over all. And then last week, we talked about him making that, that practical argument. And this week, we're going to do that once more. So we're going to read from Colossians chapter 3. So why don't you stand to your feet in honor of the word. We do that here. And if you're new, don't worry. I won't ask you to stand up anymore till the end. So either you can pay attention, take notes, or get a good nap. I'll let you decide. Colossians chapter 3, we're going to actually read verses 1 through 17 and walk through that. So you can see them on the screen or you can get them in your, uh, on your phone or in the, in the Hope Community Church app. So Colossians chapter 3, verse, starting in verse 1, say amen if you are ready. Amen. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your mind... Minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil, desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave free, but Christ is all and in all. 
Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if, and if one has a complaint against another, forgive each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So also you must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, this word is a grace to us this morning. God, we came here on purpose be encouraged by it, to be challenged by it, to be changed, changed by it. To start with the way we think, Lord, we pray by the time we get up Monday morning, it'll, it will have changed what we do. Transform us today because we are together in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, amen. amen. You may be seated. I like if-then statements. Anybody else like if-then statements? Oh. Like, if you do this, then this happens. Uh, I like mechanical things because if you, it's kind of a written rule. If you, um, somebody help me, righty, tidy, lefty, Lucy. 95.6% of the time until you find one that isn't. And then you just keep turning. Um, so I know if I turn it right, I'm going to tighten it up. The majority of the time, if I turn right, the bolt tightens. If I turn left, the bolt loosens. That's a, that's a universal thing. I know I can count on it. I don't like if maybes. I hate the uncertainty of those type of things. If you do this, this might happen. No, I, like, I like to be confident about what we're getting ready to do. If we do this, this is what happens. Fortunately, Paul doesn't say, if you've been made new in Christ, then maybe these things happen. He's, no, he says, if then, if, if then. Now, he's talking to the church. He's saying, if you've been made alive in Christ, that's what we talked about last week, being made alive, being made new in Christ. If you've been made alive in Christ, then Christ lives in you, that power is in you, the authority of him is in you. He is sitting at the right hand of the Father in the authority place, and that same authority is in you. So now Paul in chapter 3 is saying, if that is true, then this is what, we, this, this is what should happen as a result of that. Which It's a little bit rhetorical because we all know it is true, amen? So if this has happened in your life, this should be the result. He starts out, with thinking, and I also like that Paul always starts out with the way we think because what we do is a result of the way we think. Amen? I know it's popular to say I didn't mean that. I know it's popular to say I misspoke. You do realize that if it came out of your mouth, you meant it. It's almost like um, we could all be convicted of premeditated whatever. Because nothing we say is something that we haven't previously thought of. Matter of fact, I, I believe it's impossible to say something that you haven't previously thought of. So the more accurate thing was, um, I actually thought about that, but I thought I had enough self-control not to say it. Obviously, I don't. And so I ended up saying something I previously thought about you. <laughs> I can't actually say I was thinking about it now, but I have thought it, and it came out. Wow. Now we need to work on that self-control thing. That would be a more accurate statement about what we say. And what we do is the, same, is the same way. We don't do things that we haven't previously thought about or at least thought about before we did it. Nobody, if there was a clinical, um, if there was a clinical diagnosis 
to be able to do things that you haven't previously thought of or say things you haven't previously thought of, I would love to be diagnosed with it because it would give me an out. Oh, don't worry about him. He's got that disease. He always says things he didn't think. I don't know that there is one. So Paul knows that the path to us changing what we do has to be preceded by changing what we think. Now remember, there's this philosophy coming into the church, not challenging necessarily at the beginning what people were doing, but challenging what they were thinking. Hey, this is a new philosophy coming in, and it sounds fun and neat and new and Ooh, maybe it's a little bit better than this Jesus thing. It's, it's like warm and fuzzy and cool. And everybody around us is starting to take, latch on to it. And it just, it's, it's the new thing. So Paul's saying in light of, in light of uh, what's going on around you, you have to still think a certain way. And he uses it, he uses it like this. He says, um, Now that you've been made, if you've been made alive in Christ, if you've been made new, then set your minds on things above. Not on the things of this earth. So so he's saying, essentially what he is saying from now is that you're from someplace different than where you used to be. Okay, follow me. So he's saying, you have been made new in Christ. We are new creatures in Christ. So if we've been made new, then we're from, uh, we're from something, someone else. And so now Paul's saying the natural response to being from a different place is to think different than where, than where you were originally from. Everybody get that? So I, I, I told the first service, like there were some things I inherently grew up with because it was... It was where we were from, and it was where our family was from, and it was how we did things. And, and, and you know, you just say, well, that's where I'm, that's where I'm from. That's where, where I'm from, that's the way we do it. We don't even think about it, it's just the way we do it. It's where I'm from. We didn't, we didn't really have to think a lot growing up. Me and my brother were fighting, it's just what we did. So where we're from, boys fight. Amen. So what can happen is that we can then, Paul knew that if where we are from changes, we are more than likely to go along with the change because it's where we're from. Amen. So now this new philosophy is coming into the small church and he's like, hey, listen, I have to remind you that you don't think like everybody else thinks that's from around here. Now you think from where you are now from. So set your minds on things above, not on the things of this earth. Isn't it it funny how if if you start thinking like you're from a different place, you don't get as worked up about the same things the locals get worked up about. I remember being in um, Belgium last year. Pandemic was still going on, all kinds of things happening. And, and there was a discussion in the United States about um, vaccine uh, IDs, right? Uh, vaccine passports, there was a discussion. And I, 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 it never happened, but it's a discussion. And I remember uh, at the theological seminary we were at uh, working on, there was a student there, and we were having this discussion about vaccine passports and all that stuff. And, and we're from America. And specifically, if we're from Hedgesville. <sighs> now, I know some people watching online don't know what that means, but we do. <laughs> so I, re- I remember her, um, there was a conversation like, well, okay, in Belgium, you had to have a vaccine passport type thing. They put it on your ID. And they, have a, they, have, they had a chip on their ID that they could put it on there, medical records, vaccines, all that stuff. And, and she went, yeah, it's pretty convenient. And I went, oh. I said, people would shoot each other in the United States over that. I was like, don't get that thing 
near me. Like if anybody knows I touched it. But do you see how in the United, in Hedgesville, how could we ever let something like that happen? And I don't know, four or 5,000 miles away, there's, there's a student going, ah, it's pretty easy. Pop it in. My stuff's on it. Tax returns, everything. I got one card to rule them all. <laughs> there you go. Some of you will get it next time you dig out the Lord of the Rings and watch it. <laughs> and I thought, okay, this is, this is important. They are people in Belgium. Did you realize there's people in Belgium? They look like us. They can talk, read, write, add, and subtract. They go to school. They build houses. They have families. They drive cars. They have jobs. They do almost everything. I don't know if they shoot their dinner, but, um, but there's, they do a lot of the same stuff we do. But they're from somewhere else. So they think different inherently about certain really important issues they think differently than we do. Why? Because they're just from somewhere else. Because they're from somewhere else, it makes them think different. So Paul's saying, now, because you're from somewhere else, you should think different. Because you're from somewhere else, the things that, the things that everybody else is worried about, you probably shouldn't worry about. Because you're from somewhere else. The thing that everybody excuses you, you probably shouldn't go along with. Because you're from somewhere else. So he starts with the way we think. Listen, set your minds on where you're from, not where you're residing. It's a little bit difficult for Maryland people moving into Hedgesville, but to not think like you're weird. Paul's saying, Look, you, if you have been made new in Christ, then you have to think now from where you are now from. And that will change things in your life. Can I, can I just say this? It means we think different about suffering. It means we think different about success. It means we think different about hardship. It means we, we think different about conflict. It, it, it literally means it could change the way we think about almost everything in our life because let me pose this scenario to you. Because if we're suffering right now, uh, where we're from might tell us that, how does that old saying go? Misery loves company. So if because of where I'm from causes me to surround myself with other people who love misery, I may miss out on what he has for me because I'm thinking like on earth instead of like where I'm now from. Amen? that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope. Like now there's a definition to it. Now I don't have to think like everybody else. Now I don't have to be woe is me all the time. Now I don't have to be, now I can have a peace that passes on understanding. Why? Because I'm thinking like now from the new place I'm from. Now I have a context that nobody thinking down here can get unless we think on things above. So, so what happens is, Paul says, first of all, you have to change the way you think. Now you have to think like you're from a different place. Set your minds on things above. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus reinforces this. Or Jesus said it first, Paul's reinforcing it. Watch, watch what he does here. Sermon on the Mount. Very important sermon that Jesus preaches. That's where you get all the blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. And he goes into this in chapter five, this thing, you've heard it said. He says it six times, some variation of that statement. You've heard it said, you've heard it said, you've heard it said, you've heard it said. How many of you grew up in a family where you're like, you know, that's the way we do it. You know, it's the way we do it. Paul's saying that to the people listening to him. You've heard it said. You know how everybody does it around here. You've heard it said. You've heard it said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. Well, I'm telling you now, you're from a new place. 
that we don't just love our neighbor, we love everybody. Look at your neighbor and say, I love you even if nobody else does because I'm from a different place than everybody else. You looked the wrong way, didn't you? <laughs> You're like, oh, I'm related to them. Um, you've heard it said, this is the way things operate, but I'm telling you that's not the way it works anymore. You've heard it said, this is the way things operate, but I'm telling you that's not the way it works anymore. Jesus was trying to convince people that, look, once you're made alive, once you're made new, then you're part of a different place. You can't use the old excuse, oh, I'm just from, this is just the way we do it. No, we're from somewhere else. So Jesus says, you've heard it said, this is the way things work around here, but I'm telling you that's not true anymore. You're part of the kingdom of God, so things work differently. We have to think about it differently. So Paul's great at making lists. I like it when he makes lists because then we can take the list and we can go, oh, okay, this is what I should be doing and this is what I shouldn't be doing. So if I'm thinking different, then that causes me to what? It will eventually, hopefully, very quickly cause me to act differently. So it'll cause me to talk differently, act differently, do things differently, and pretty soon people will be able to tell I'm not, we're not from the same place anymore. Amen? So Paul gives two lists, and I like, to, I like to define them as this, the don't do list and the do do list. And we can tell that most of you have not started thinking differently <laughs> because it's just do, do this list. So the don't do, he starts out with what not to do. He starts out with the don't do list. Verse five, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. He's saying this is why the wrath of God is being poured out, sin. In these you two once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. So right at the end of that, he, he comes back to the idea. After the list, he says, remember, we're all from a different spot. We're not even talking about nationalities anymore. We're not talking about religion anymore. We're all made new through Christ who is all and in all. So he reinforces the don't do list with remember where you're from. People from this place don't do these things. All right. There's one key statement he says there at the beginning. And we have to work through this a little bit because I think, I think some, some people, there, there, there's some philosophy out there we need to, we need to change immediately. And, and he uses a very final statement, a very strong statement when it comes to what not to do. Go back to the verse five. Can you guys do that back there? Go back to verse five. He says, put to death sin. Now, I worked it out with first service that they would go ahead and get out of the building and not tell you that we were going to talk about sin today. It worked. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. Okay, now this is important. I need you to lean into me for a second because I think there's been a misconception of how sin, how sin is dealt with in our lives. Because I, I've been at church longer than I can even remember. My parents, I grew up in church and, and it's, it's been my whole existence. And I can remember the church's response to sin like this, Lord, take this sin from me. 
Maybe some of you have prayed that in here before. You're struggling with a sin. And you say, Lord, just take it from me. Take this desire from me. Take it. This addiction from me. Take it from me. Take it from me. Take it from me. And then, we, and then we get up from the old school altar area, tears running down our face. And for 30 seconds, we feel convinced that he has done it, only Monday morning to fall back down into it. Let me preface this whole conversation we're getting ready to have about sin by this. We are not talking about God forgiving you of your sin. We're talking about you putting to death your sin. Two different paths here. God is faithful and just to forgive us. Amen? He will forgive us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. Paul is not arguing about whether you're forgiven or not. He's arguing whether you continue to sin. He's not arguing whether God will forgive you. He's not, argue, he's, not, he's not saying, well, I don't know if he's going to forgive you anymore. You better hurry up. He's not even making that point. He's saying he's, he's showing us where the responsibility lies to cease sinning. So do you notice he doesn't say God will put to death the sin in your life. Just sit back and chill and, 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 and keep doing what you were doing before, and he'll just, he'll just eliminate it. Does that ever work for anybody? That has never worked for me. If you keep going around the same people, watching the same stuff, saying the same stuff, hanging out with the same crowd, and participating in the same things, guess what? You will keep repeating the same sin. You ever heard a cat has nine lives? Man, why did God have to give cats nine lives? I'd be okay with a pony having nine lives. I'd be okay with a cow having nine lives, but a cat. Sin has a hundred lives. And just like you can toss a cat up in the air and it ends up landing on its feet, you can play around with sin and not put it to death and it'll pop back up the next day. Paul says, you put it to death. Now, now you say, well, how can I do that? Don't disconnect these two things. He says that you've been made new in Christ, that Christ is seated on the right hand of the Father. We go back to chapter 1. We know he is supreme. He is the preeminence. All things were made by him. Nothing was made without him. That he is God in the flesh. That, that he is our salvation. And then we go to chapter 2 and we find out we've been made new and alive in him and we've been transformed by his power, and we find out that that same power is living in us. Now we get to chapter 3, and he says, if this has all happened, then you put the sin to death. Huh. Paul is saying, because you're from a different place, you think different, and you don't tolerate the same things in your life that everybody else on the earth will tolerate. So he, he doesn't say, come up to the front of the church and kneel down with tears streaming down your face and beg God to take the sin from you. No, he says, you kill it. He says, you choke it to death. I say, well, Chris, how do, we, how, do, how do you kill sin? Just like that, you choke it to death. You don't give it any oxygen. means if your phone's causing you to sin, choke it to death. If the TV's causing you to sin, choke it to death. If the people you're hanging around with is causing... <laughs> Man, that philosophy is working for a lot, really well. Um, get around somebody else. <laughs> um, Paul all of a sudden says, you're the gatekeeper of what you allow in your life. And the problem, is, well, the problem is, God gave us access to somewhere else, and we've still been playing around like we're from the old school, like we're from our old town. And Paul's saying, listen, you've got, if, you, if Christ is new in you, if you have been made new, then you don't think like everybody else. 
So, so when, when the temptation, you can't play around with, you can't play around with drugs and just be okay and be able to put, you can't, you can't just, can't just dabble in it a little bit. Paul says, put it to death. Put it to death like your life depends on it. Put it to death. Stop entertaining it a little bit. Stop justifying a little bit. And he makes a list of the things that we should be killing in our lives. And in case you thought sexual immorality was a new 2022 thing, he writes it in the first century church. As long as people have been accustomed to sin, it has started with sex. Come on. And at some point in time, as the church, we have to say, that is not godly. And if you're in a situation right now, in a, in a relationship or, or anything sexually immoral, he's telling you to put it to death. For you to stop, for you to change your habits, for you. He said, you've been given a new mind to think differently. Now kill it. I know this may be old school preaching, but it's, it's the Bible. He doesn't put off the responsibility to anybody else. I'm responsible for what I think and I do, period. I wish there was somebody else to blame, but the devil didn't make you do anything. Kill it. In case you think he only wrote that to the Colossians, he wrote it to the Romans too. Therefore, brothers and sisters, Romans chapter eight, verse 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation but it's not to the flesh, it's not to, it's not to where we're from, to live according to it, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Did you hear that? It's the same thing he writes to the Colossians. He says, this list is why the wrath of God is coming. Paul's saying the same thing, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit, you, who did he say? You. Look at your neighbor and say, you. And I got a list. Never mind. <laughs> For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Church, how do we, how do we ever walk outside this building and encourage new life to somebody who has no idea what we're talking about? when we can't put to death a couple sins. You know what the modern church has propagated to people that don't believe? Come to Jesus and at least you'll, you'll be able to feel okay about the sin. At least there'll be some forgiveness for it. But we're just as impotent as everybody else. We can't really get rid of it either. That's what the modern church is, is propagating. We're, we're saying we're, we're, just as, we're just as undisciplined as everybody else, even though the power of Jesus lives in us. And you might be saying, how does, well, how can I do that, Chris? Because if you go all the way back to chapter one, Paul says the supreme Jesus, creator of everything, all authority is in him, is now in you. So it's not just you getting up and going, oh, it's going, I have authority over this in my life. I'm not going to blame anybody else. I'm not going to blame it on any, anything else. I'm going to take authority over this in my life, and it will not keep happening. Amen? So listen. That means you may have to check yourself into a rehab. That means you may have to get somebody to hold you accountable. That means you may have to end a relationship. That means you may have to get somebody in your life to tell you that's not right. It's still our responsibility. And Paul's saying if you play around with sin, expect wrath. Expect it. But nowadays, we play around with sin and we expect blessing because, well, Lord, I'm only playing. I'm only playing with it. I'm not serious about it. i got friends that are serious about sinning. I'm just playing around. No, he says, listen, there's not enough room. To, there's, there's no room to play around. Kill it. I want you to strangle it to death. 
And the world will take notice when they see the church rise up and say, no more in my life. God has forgiven me. He will forgive me. But he has also given me the power to not be held captive by those things anymore. He's given me the authority in my life to proclaim a death sentence to the things that are going to hold me back, impact my family, impact my job, impact the people around me. I will not allow it anymore in my life. Kill it. And when the church gets serious about it, the world will lift their heads. Not prudish. Not we're better than everybody else. But we're just from somewhere else. We've been given authority. We're not going to put up with it anymore. And by the way, if you put it to death in your life, don't croak in a crusade to put it to death in anybody else's life. That's their responsibility. You know how it works. I got victory over it. Now I'm able to wag my finger at everybody else who's still dealing with it. <laughs> well, the Lord gave me victory over it. I don't know why you're having such a trouble. No, why don't you walk over and you help them strangle it to death? Amen? Put it to death. Most, I would venture to say most of our problems is because they're unwilling to kill it. Just like a cat with nine lives, sin just keeps popping back up. He doesn't stop with a don't do list. He gives us a do do list. <laughs> when you've killed sin, when you've put it to death, you're going to put on this. So what I love about Paul is he doesn't leave, of, leave us vulnerable. We're not just over here like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm just, put, just killing sin in my life. You know, it's exhausting. He ends with, now put on some good stuff. Now let's, now let's focus on doing the right thing. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts. Have compassion hearts, have kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, by the way, do you know you can disagree and not sin? There's a chance you could be wrong. A very good chance. And so Paul's even adding in here, when you have conflict with each other, as it, and it hasn't reached the point of sin yet, because, because we're not, we're just having a disagreement. He says, when you have a disagreement, forgive each other. Because the Lord's forgiven you, so you need to forgive. Somebody say amen. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. You want peace? Put sin to death and put on these things. To which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness for your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus because that's where you're from. Now I'm not working to please men. Now I'm not working to get ahead. Now I'm working because I'm from somewhere else. I'm working because, because, I have, because I've been made new in Christ. And this is how it works in the new kingdom. We don't respond like the locals. When we get in fights, we don't fight like the locals. We forgive each other. Amen? We don't hold grudges like the locals. We forgive each other. We're not proud like the locals. And I don't, you know I'm not talking about just Hedgesville. We're not impatient like the locals. We don't let our differences cause us to hate each other like the locals. Now, here's, here's something that I need to let you know about this. So Paul writes to the Colossians, and it's like he's writing the pathway us, for us to fulfill a prayer Jesus prayed in John. Because Paul's saying, once you realize you're all from a different place now, 
Once you realize you've all been made new, once you realize you, you all have a different residency in the kingdom of God, once you realize that you all are thinking on things above, not on things of this earth, once you realize that all of you have the capacity and power within you, the Holy Spirit in you to put to death sin and put on these things that make us compassionate and loving towards each other, all of a sudden, when we act like that, we fulfill the prayer Jesus prayed in John. It's called the priestly prayer, and Jesus prays it like this. John chapter 17, verse 20 through 23. He says, I do not, he's already praying. We're jumping in the middle of the prayer. I do not ask for these only, but for also those who will believe in me through their word. So he had started praying for the disciples, and then he said, I don't ask just for these people, but I ask for all the people that are going to believe because of them. So that includes you and me. So Jesus, back in John chapter 17, is praying to the Father for you and me to be one. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one, I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you loved me. Church, you know, the crazy thing is we have over centuries developed these outreach programs to our neighborhoods. We gotta figure out how to reach the world. We gotta figure out how to go into a neighborhood and convince our friends that Jesus is real. Do you realize Jesus' prayer gives us, gives us the formula for that? He says it twice in John chapter 17. He says, if this happens, then they will know that you sent me. If this happens, they will know that you sent me. He says it twice, right there that they may be, that may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. What does that mean? So that the world may believe that Jesus is the Christ. There's, there's only one way to heaven through him. So he says that, he says that in verse 21. Then if you come down to John chapter 17, verse 23, he says it again that the world may know that you sent me. Then Paul says to the Colossians, you're from a different place, so that should cause you to think different. And once you start thinking like where you're now from, you can put sin to death. And you know if the church gets serious about judging ourselves, the world will start paying attention. And then once we put sin to death and we start treating each other as Jesus and the Father are one in each other and now they're one in us, then the whole formula, if then, then the whole formula starts making sense. If we start treating, if we put sin to death and we start treating each other, we put on humility, we put on kindness, we put on forgiveness, then when we walk out, Jesus prayed back in John 17, then the world will know that I'm the Christ. You won't have to come up with something tricky. Forgive every time you get the opportunity. Love every time you get the opportunity. Be gracious every time you get the opportunity. Put on these things every time you get the opportunity. And then every time sin pops up, kill that sucker. And then when we walk out of these buildings, people will go, there's something different. There's something, there's a power in them that I don't have. They're from somewhere else. You don't have to be tricky. We just have to put on the gospel. So why don't we stand and make that commitment together this morning? Listen, if you're here in this room today and there's a sin in your life that you haven't choked the life out of yet, I want you to make a commitment. I don't want you to ask God to take it from you. I don't want you to do that this morning. I want you to lift your hands and surrender and say, God, you gave me power through the Holy Spirit in me to kill this thing today. And I'm gonna take every measure necessary to choke it to death. This week, Lord, I claim authority over what the devil is trying to do in my life and I'll give it no more oxygen to breathe. I'll give it no more oxygen to live. I'll do whatever 
it takes to put it to death. And then I want you to make the same commitment I'm going to put on all those things that come with where you are. Lord, we're making that commitment this morning. We put it to death, Lord. Over and over, as many times as it takes, it's our responsibility. And we accept it, and you've empowered us to be able to do it. And Lord, we put on love today. Love for each other, love for our enemy, love for the love for our neighbors. Lord, we put on love. And Lord, we want the world to see us united as one so that they would know that you are our Savior. We make that commitment this morning. Empower us to do what we, you've asked us to do.